those of, of us who have walked with the Lord for a period of time and have been under the instruction of pastors and Bible teachers, you've heard it said that we must love the sinner but hate the sin. We also have heard that God loves every person, loves the sinner, and hates the sin. And you remember Jesus' words, even he spoke them on the pure, uh, Sermon on the Mount. He said, you've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies, bless those who curse you, do good to those who hate you, and pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you that you may be the sons of your Father in heaven, for he makes the sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? But if you greet your brethren only, what do you do more than others? Do not even the tax collectors do so? Therefore you shall be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now, everybody will say, yeah, th that's the way it should be. Now, listen. Listen to David's words. We are in Psalm 30, 139. You can turn your Bibles there. We are on the last paragraph. There are four paragraphs. And we're on the last one now in our favorite uh, the chapter here, Psalm 139, written by David. But to this last paragraph, we're going to review a little bit what we've covered. But listen to what he says. Now, how, how this last paragraph starts out in verse 19. David says to the Lord, Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? And do not I loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. And see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. What a change, okay? Before we try to figure out David's vindictive words in this paragraph, let's remember what we have already observed in uh, this psalm. Um, if you look back at the first verse, David starts out and he says just what he ends with, Search me, O God. O Lord, you have searched me and known you. And we summarized this psalm. I said, uh, I'm using Warren Wearsby, a man who died a few years ago, but he, he was an excellent outliner. And he, he outlined this psalm. There are four paragraphs, and each one has six verses. The first paragraph that David wrote through the Holy Spirit, he says, God knows us intimately so we cannot deceive him. Look at, at verse 2 now, what David says. You know my sitting down and my rising up. You understand my thought afar off. He knows what you're thinking right now, even when you're daydreaming. God knows. Uh, you, you comprehend my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all of my ways. There is not a word on my tongue, but behold, O Lord, you know it all together. But even before we speak it, the Lord knows what we're going to say. This God that created this universe is an awesome God. He knows us intimately, and we cannot deceive him. And then he ends this by saying, You have hedged me behind and before and laid your hand on me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is high. I cannot attain it. I tell you, ever since we've been in that psalm, I've been thinking about these things. God, you know, he created this universe, and he has got such an awesome mind. Remember Jesus said that the very hairs on your head are numbered? And all through this universe, what a mind he has to have that at the same time, he is knowing all about us, okay? So he's intimately acquainted. We can't deceive him. We can't even try. Well, then the next paragraph is this. God not only knows us intimately, but he is with us constantly. So we cannot escape him. Listen to David's words. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in hell or a shield or the grave, behold, you are there. 
If I take my wings of the morning, okay, as the sun rises in the east, I take my wings in the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea. The sea to them was on the, these people in Israel was on the west, the Mediterranean Sea. So it's from the sunrise to the sunset. He says, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, there's a lot of people who practice their evil works in the darkness. If I say, surely the darkness shall fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. So God is with us constantly. We cannot escape him. That's with every person. Now, David was a believer, and we're going to get into that here, but let's go on with this next paragraph. It says this, um, God made us wonderfully so we cannot ignore him. Remember last week we were saying even on Mother's Day, you know, the little girl asked her mother, first of all, Mother, how, how did we come to be? And she said, well, God created Adam and Eve, and then they had sons and daughters, and they had more children until it come right down to day, today. So she was thinking about this, and she asked her dad, Dad, I told you this last week, but I'm bit, for those who weren't here last week, Dad, how did we come to be? And he said, well, it's like this. In the evolutionary process, there were higher land animals that we would call maybe apes or gorillas today, and they were sexually active, and they gave rise to higher beings. And so that's the way we came about from the, the animals, from the, the apes, as it were. And so this girl was really confused now, and she says to her mom, uh, Mom, you said that we came in, in, from Adam and Eve, and Dad says we came from evolution in, in animals and monkeys. And she said, oh, it's really simple, dear. I told you where my side of the family comes from, and he told you where his side of the family comes from, Okay. No, you know what? The Bible says God knows us intimately and he created us. Look at the, what he says here. You formed my inward parts. You covered me in my mother's womb. I will praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are your works. And that my soul knows very well. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and skillfully, it's like embroidered, it's like knit together, skillfully wrought in the lowest parts of the earth, and the, uh, uh, symbolic for the mother's womb. Your eyes saw my substance being yet unformed, and in your book they were all written. God made you who you are, and not only that, the days fashioned for me when as yet none of them were. God made us wonderfully. We cannot ignore him. And then David says, How precious also are your thoughts to me, O God. How great is the sum of them. If I should count them, they would be more in number than the sand. When I awake, I'm still with you. And I think he's talking about the last waking. When he arises from the dead, God's still going to be with us, you see. Now that, he's praising God how great God is, but then notice the next paragraph, oh, that you would slay the wicked. Now how in the world does it come to, when he's talking about the hatred that he has for these people, how did that come about from what he had just said? Well, you realize that comes right after everything he said about God's greatness. It seems such a sudden turn of spirit because you know, he's, he's just praising God, and all of a sudden, it's like he, he get turned sour, and he's praying that God would wipe out people who are made also in the image of God. What is this about? How could he change so um, differently this way? I think one of the reasons is, is because we live in a different environment they, they, they lived, and we are influenced by viewpoints in our society, even the Christian society. And I stated one of the things that we are always told, we hear, is, God, we need to love the sinner but hate the sin. We love everybody. We love our enemies. Jesus said that, we, so we understand it. But even as David draws close to God, an appreciation for what he is like and what he has done, he cannot stand it when people reject the Lord, blaspheme his name, and rise up in rebellion against the Lord. Now, here's the little... Uh, the difference. 
David is not talking about his enemies. He's talking about who? The enemies of God. Okay? It's like this. Have you had loved ones in your family? And somebody has spoken against your loved one, whether it's a mother, whether it's father, whether it's brother, sister, or child. Isn't this true that, I mean, that bothers us more if they criticize us. We get very angry at a person who does wrong to our loved ones. Why? Because of the love that we have for them. Okay, can you understand David's feelings now to this great God who loves him so much He's got more thoughts toward David than the sands on the seashore. And now he thinks about those who disrespect him, who take his name in vain. They're, they're violent and they kill a, 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 against God's word. That's why he's angry. So in this fourth chapter, we say this, talking about God's righteous judgment. We saw his all-knowing, everywhere present, and his tremendous creation, his power in creation, And now we need to see this. God judges righteously. We cannot dispute him. You see, there are times when we wonder, how can the Lord let this, the wicked people do what they do? How does that happen? And David says, finds out there's two places wickedness come from. There's people that are just wicked people. But then he knows, says this. There's also wickedness in his heart. We're going to get to that. There's wickedness in, your, in my heart as well. So we're going to look at that. But God judges righteously. We cannot dispute him. We cannot argue with him. He's the one who judges righteously. We might say it doesn't seem right. Why do these wicked people prosper? And why do people who serve you and do what's right, they have so many difficulties and they have health problems and everything else? It just doesn't seem fair. And I think one of the things is this. You and I can dispute and we can have tendencies to judge God wrongly because we think wrongly about God, sin, and sinners. God, sin, and sinners. We could ask this. Do we love and hate as the scriptures teach us? Let me say that again. Do we love and hate as the scriptures teach us? First of all, We already mentioned the love of God. Do we love God like David loved God? And so we're really offended when somebody does against that God that's so personal to us. But I I want you to notice again to whom David is showing this hatred. The ones that he wants to be slain are those who hate God. It's not his own personal enemies. David had a lot of enemies. He really did. Saul chased him, and a lot of people were chasing him. They wanted to put him to death. But he's not talking about his enemies. He's talking about the enemies of God. And he says, rather than, you know, he says, Do I not hate them, O Lord, who hate you? Do not I loathe those who rise up against you? This past week, I had a relative who made some accusations against my daughters. My daughters are married. They have kids. But they made, this relative made some accusations. And I was mad. I was really mad. And I had all my do, the thing that I could do to hold my temper against this person, you know. Nancy saw me from a distance. <laughs> she, she knew I was having a heated argument, you know, because I thought it was unjust and it was unfair. I know my girls. But I want you to see in the Old Testament some things that were happened to help us understand David's hatred of those who hated God. There, were, there was a, a, as you know, the nation of Israel, after King Solomon, first Saul, then David, and King Solomon, the nation divided in two. Ten kings were in the, uh, uh, king, uh, tribes were in the north, two were in the south. The, uh, the nation in the north was called Israel. The nation in the south was called Judah. And Judah had some good kings. But the kings in the north part part of Israel, the ten tribes, there wasn't a one good king among them. They were all idolaters. One of the worst was Ahab. King Ahab and his wife, who provoked him in many ways, was Jezebel. And she brought all her idol worship to the capital city of the northern kingdom called Samaria. But this son of Ahab, this wicked king, was named Jehoram. He came down 
to a good king in the south called King Jehoshaphat. And he said, we have been over the king Moab now. King Moab has rebelled, rebelled us. Will you go with me to battle against the king of Moab? And these were the words of King Jehoshaphat to King Jehoram. I will go up. I am as you are. My people are as your people. My horses are as your horses. What a kind response he had to someone who hated God. This, this man didn't, this is a king that did not love God. It, it just Jehoshaphat ought to have learned this because he at went went to war with King Ahab. He did the same thing with King Ahab. King Ahab wanted to know, will you go with me to battle? And King Jehoshaphat said, my people, is your, my horses are as your horses. I'll gladly go with you. And it was a disaster. The battle ended and, and, and King Ahab was killed, killed in the battle. King Jehoshaphat was nearly killed. But afterward, the prophet came to this good King Jehoshaphat in the south and said, should you help the wicked and love those who hate the Lord? Therefore, the wrath of the Lord is upon you. Nevertheless, good things are found in you, and you have removed the wooden images from the land and have prepared your heart to seek after God. Can you see the difference between the way Elisha treated those wicked kings? This is what he said, the Elisha. When they, they came, these three kings, uh, the king of Israel, and they had the king of Edom with them, and then Jehoshaphat, they came to him. They sought out Elisha. They knew this prophet was a great prophet, uh, King Jehoshaphat recommended him. And they came to him and they were seeking, uh, seeking God's favor. And, and this is the way Elisha treated these men. He said to the king of Israel, What have I to do with you? Go to your prophets of your father and the prophets of your mother. And then when they replied back, King uh, Elisha the prophet, the good prophet of the Lord said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand. Surely, uh, if, if I did not regard the presence of King Jehoshaphat, I would not look at you or see you. Wow. He, this is the type of reaction that David had toward those who hated him. How did King Jehoshaphat react toward those who hated the Lord? He said, my people is your people. Hey, I'm kind to everybody. I love everybody. Jehoshaphat would have shown more love to these idolatrous, wicked kings if he would have said, no, I'm sorry, I cannot go out with you to battle because you show so, such disrespect, you don't obey the Lord. Do you see the wisdom, what King David is saying? It's not that I want you to do away with my enemies, but your enemies, Lord, slay them. I want you to slay them because they're so disrespectful. They hate you. Put them out of their misery. That's what David felt toward these people who hated the Lord. Also considering the question, you know, one of the ways that we don't understand the way the Lord deals uh, with things is the Lord is slow to judgment. When wicked people do different things, and we say, you know what? Ah, oh, just hate it. They show such hatred toward God. But God, like he doesn't do anything about it. Why? The Bible says God is patient. He's patient. And the book of Peter says he's not willing that any should perish. He gives them time to turn from their wicked ways. But listen, God's judgment will fall. Just like this earth at one time, you know, science, our modern science, goes against the Noah's flood. But listen, my friends, everywhere you look today, you see evidences of Noah's flood. There was a time when God put up and he was patient with people, but when it became so wicked on this earth, he destroyed every person on this globe except eight. Noah and his family. Remember, they built this big ark. You can see a replica of this down in south of Cincinnati. But they were all wiped out. All, the, and all these animals were brought to Noah. And you say, oh, that's just a fairy tale. You know, that's just one of those Bible stories, that fairy tale. I'm sorry, no. 
This is what I was taught in science. When we pass through where the, the roads pass through and you see the, the sedimentary lock and all those layers, what I was taught going to the university, these are layers that are laid down over millions of years. It's like newspapers that one pile on top of another and it shows how old the earth is. They are called, what are they called? Sedimentary rocks. They were formed in the presence of water. When the, this earth, when it washed, have you seen some of the flooding down south? You see how massively destructive water can be? Can you imagine every mountain on the earth being covered with water? What massive, that's why you have the, when we were down in Georgia, lived down, the red clay over states. Why? Because God deposited that red clay all over those states. The Grand Canyon was a Grand Canyon formed by that little river that runs over billions of years. Or was it formed by a massive flooding of waters? You see, there's so much evidence for Noah's flood, but man tries to deny that, and they set up alternatives. Listen, if man evolved, I mean, there's just no chance that he could evolve. There is absolutely no chance. There is such a thing as microevolution, where God has built an adaptation within creatures. He does. And uh, so that's why we got the adaptations. We see the original one might have been a wolf, and we got all these, God put it in the DNA structure so that we got all these variants of dogs now today, you see. God created it in a masterful way. But you and I, can you imagine how tough it must have been for those people who had the eye evolve before they could really see? I mean, it didn't happen overnight, right? It happened over billions of years according to evolution. No, God in his masterful, amazing, engineering mind created everything that we see today. Don't you love springtime? I'm telling you, going with my wife. Do you see these little purple flowers, these wild flowers? <laughs> you know, the weeds? Beautiful wild and white flowers. Nancy, we were for a walk yesterday. She picked some of those beautiful. This is God's way he paints this world. You see the way the sunset is? We were admiring the clouds when the sun set last night. God is the masterful engineer. His mind is so great, he created this world. The first death that ever happened. Now this totally, you talk about the environment we're in. I'm sorry to keep on riding these hobby horses sometimes, but our world is so much against this. The first death that ever was, was when God killed the lamb to clothe Adam and Eve in coats of skin. And they saw it. And after that, they started, God taught them that by the shedding of blood, sin was covered. And that principle went right through the Old Testament until the perfect Lamb of God came, who was Jesus, who completely took away the sin of the world. God and his plan. He loves us, okay? But anyway, uh, he uh, not only loves us, of course, he judges righteously, so we can't dispute him, okay, and wonder, what, what's he doing? How about when Jesus, how Jesus treated people? How did Jesus treat that woman caught in adultery? Where are your accusers, woman? They, they all left. So Jesus told those people who brought him to him, those religious leaders, let the one without sin be the first to cast the stone. Jesus told us, be careful how you judge others, because you might have a log in your eye and you're trying to take a speck out of somebody else's eye, you see. But, but he was gracious toward people who fell in sin. He told that woman, go ahead, I don't condemn you, go and sin no more. But how did he treat Herod, King Herod? Remember how he treated King Herod when he stood before him at the trial? King Herod hated God and he put one of his special prophets named John the Baptist to death. You know how Jesus treated him? He didn't speak a word to him, never spoke a word. He wouldn't answer a question that he posed to him. You could say it this way, Jesus did not give King Herod the time of day. He, he treated those who hated God in a different way. See, so if we're, we're kind to everybody, oh, sure, you can, uh, you abort babies, God loves you. No, I mean, if, if a person knowingly puts others to death who are violent, the scripture says God hates those who do violence, okay? So 
it's just amazing here as we think about this. You know, this is what Psalm 11 says. The Lord tests the righteous, but the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. That's what the Bible says. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone and burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. Do you remember when Mother Teresa was speaking? I don't know what event it was, but Bill Clinton was in the front row. Bill Clinton was a great proponent for abortion. Women's freedom to have sexual reproductive lights and abort the babies that are in their womb. Mother Teresa squared it up and she said those who are aborting and are for abortion are committing murder and Bill Clinton got very uneasy and gla- grabbed for his glass of water to drink it because that little woman who rescued those in poverty and all that pointed a finger at those who were wrong she showed hatred toward those who hated God right amen it's not kind so somebody who is, uh, who is hating God, totally disregarding God to tell them God loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. He does. God has a wonderful But when they're living in sin, you warn them and you take your stand against them. They're not our enemies. They're God's enemies. Does that make sense? That's why David did what he did. Another thing we ought to consider, we don't consider... Uh, uh, some of these ones who show such hatred of God. Also, we need to consider how much we ought to hate sin. We ought to love God. We ought to hate sin. Uh, God said in a prophecy, the Lord said a prophecy in the Old Testament about the Messiah, that is Jesus. You have loved righteousness and hate wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. Psalm 97.10 states this. You who love the Lord hate evil. He preserves the souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. The New Testament says the same thing. So Romans 12, 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Could it be that you and I don't hate sin like we need to hate sin? Do we toy with sin? Oh, yeah, we joke with people who are just doing things that are incredibly wrong. And they're practicing evil in a rebellious way before the Lord. So we need to see and consider uh, how much we ought to hate sin. And there's one other thing we ought to consider. And this, all of us can fall, fall into this. We need, and we're talking about our wrong attitudes toward God's sin and sinners, we need to consider how we might think wrongly how God hates us. Let me say that again. We might think wrongly how God hates us hates us. We, need, uh, we might take the viewpoint that God really wants to punish us all the time. That is a cop just waiting to give somebody a ticket, right? Do you remember how David thinks of God here? Oh, man. He, he knows everything about me. He knows the way I think. He knows the, e- the evil thoughts I have in my mind. He knows all about it, and he still loves me. I can't flee from his presence. Jonah tried to flee from the Lord. He found out he could not do it. You can't flee from the Lord. You can't escape him. When David considered the way he created him so marvelously, you got a a, a supercar? You got a Tesla? Wouldn't it be wonderful to have a Tesla, right? Tesla is child's play concerned to this way the body, the Lord made this body. I told you about the time I was with a, a man in our church. We were standing outside a church in, in, outside the Detroit area there. We saw this huge, I don't know if it was a 737, it was a seven, maybe it was a 747, I don't know, huge plane flying lowly over this. And we go, wow, consider how amazing is that who created and, and, and could put that into flight like that. And then we went a step further. Consider the one who made the man who created the plane exponentially God's creation is so much superior to anything that man comes up with, right? So David just praised God, and your, your thoughts toward me are more than the sands of the sea. Have you ever tried to call the sands of the sea? David says, that's how much you think about me. He was appreciative toward God. But now let me go back to that story. I told you about the three kings, and they got Elisha, and Elisha squared with them right away, right? But... 
Elisha told him, why don't you go to your prophets, the ones that your father and your mother served. And this is what the king of Israel said. Alas, no, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them into the hand of Moab. What's that? You see, they went out, those three kings went out. They were going toward Moab, but they wandered around in the desert for a while. And for seven days, they had absolutely no water. And so this was King Jehoram's reaction. It's because the Lord wanted to deliver us into the hand. He wanted us to defeat us. He wanted us to be defeated. And when Elisha talked to them, why don't you go to your prophets and stuff that your father, parents, she said, and once again the king said, no, for the Lord has called these three kings together to deliver them to the hand of Moab. God wants us to fail. God wants us to be defeated. Let me tell you, that is not the truth of Scripture. God is created you. He has a plan for your life. Even if you don't believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, he created you to believe in Christ and to know what his purposes were in your life. Listen, there is no better life anywhere than to be a follower of Jesus Christ. No matter what your job is, but if you know that he's got a plan for you, it is the most wonderful life anybody could ever live. But God created everybody. He's got a plan. But there are people who rebel against him. They think that God really hates them. Now listen. We can go against the Lord. And the Lord can, can hate those who do violence, right? We said that. But listen. When we come to the Lord, we pray to the Lord, and we say, Lord, forgive my sin. What is it that I've done? And the Lord shows you, forgive my sin. The Lord will set you on a solid rock. God will forgive you. God will take care of you if you come to him in repentance. God does not reward us for doing wrong. And if he is not answering our prayers or blessing us, go to him and say, Lord, why aren't you blessing? Why aren't you getting me a job like I need to get a job? Why aren't you prospering us? Ask him. You know King David, the one who wrote this song? David did some things that were really bad. His heart was deceitful. Do you remember what he did? He committed adultery with Bathsheba, the wife of Uriah. And then to cover up, she was pregnant. To cover up what he had done, he called Uriah, tried to go home to make love with his wife. He wouldn't do it. He said, no, the, the armies are on the field. They're sleeping out. Oh, I'm not going to go home and relax and have it, all this calm and, and peace when they're, they're struggling in a battle. I'm not going home. David tried to get him drunk. And then finally he sent him with orders, which he knew he wouldn't open up, and the orders were sent, send Uriah to the front lines and, so that he gets killed. Jo, Joab, the commander, did what he told him. He killed Uriah. David actually killed Uriah, and God was displeased with what David did, hated what David did, and he gave David trouble for the rest of his life. But David, he put David's sins away. And one of the things you'll notice about King David, watch it if you read about King David. If ever he had a question about what should I do, what should I do, Lord? Am I doing right? You know what he did? Send me the ephod. The ephod was this covering that the priest wore, and they'd have a, a, a urim and a thummim in it. One was a black ball, one was a white ball. Should I go? They shake it, and what other thing comes out was white ball. And there were other things that were revealed. David always sought the Lord for answers. Am I doing wrong? Do you want me to go against these people? And God gave him instruction. You know, God will do that for us, too, if we don't see the blessing of the Lord. God shows grace toward his enemies and dares them to follow the truth. He's not willing that any should perish. Now, so we can think wrongly about God and we can think wrongly about ourselves. And that's why David, David, because of what he experience he had, he, he, he committed adultery, he put a man to death. So at the end of this psalm, he realizes what was in his heart. You know, the, the Bible says the heart is desperately wicked and utterly deceitful. That's why we go to the Lord and say, Lord, I don't even, I don't even know if my motives are right in what I'm thinking here. God will reveal that to us if we go to him and ask him to show it. David wanted God to search his heart. 
and, and deal with these anxieties, the troubling thoughts that are in his heart. We ought to be gracious toward people who fall into sin. But for those people who hate God, we don't treat them buddy-buddy at all. Not at all. David was very... Treated these others who hated God just like Elisha the prophet did. Let me read it one more time. Listen how David... And he says, it's not his enemies... Oh, that you would slay the wicked, O God. Depart from me, therefore, you bloodthirsty men. For they speak evil against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do not I hate them, O Lord, who hate you. And do not I loathe those who rise up against you. I hate them with a perfect hatred. I count them my enemies. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties and see if there's any wicked way in me. And lead me in the way everlasting. David said, search me, let me. Show me any sin that in my heart. That's a brave way. Now let me just close. By David wanted to be led. Lead me in the way everlasting. Not the wicked way, but the way everlasting. There are a lot of people who just don't have the courage and the faith to do it God's way. They try to do it their own way. You know, I read a book called by Franklin Graham, In the Name. And Franklin Graham was called, you know, he's the son of Billy Graham. You know, just recently they unveiled a great big statue. that It's close to the Capitol, I guess. And uh, the speaker, Mike Johnson, spoke. I don't know all that spoke. Probably Franklin Graham was there. But Franklin Graham, who is the leader of Samaritan's Purse, he's been asked to give prayer at many convocations, maybe even the start of the congressional session and stuff like that. But you know what? He always, always prays in the name of Jesus. He doesn't bypass it. You have people, oh, people are offended. I mean, there's, there's Muslims in the Congress. There's Jewish people in the Congress. They'll be offended if you play in the name of Jesus. He just, just does not care. I got to do what pleases God, the one who created me. He, one who sent his son to pay for our sins on the cross. I pray in the name of Jesus. You know, it takes courage sometimes. We want to do our own things. If the Lord tells us we, he wants us to give to something, some poor, some missionary that are doing work, we say, oh, I don't know if I can afford it. Listen, courage. If God wants you to do something, you do it. Last illustration of this, in considering how we treat people who hate the Lord and such, I heard yesterday morning at men's breakfast, Nancy and I have been busy out at the lake, and so we haven't been watching news like we ought. But the men were talking about Harrison Butker's speech at Benedictine College. Anybody hear about that? The news is all up in arms about the many enemies. Harrison Butker is who? He's the kicker for the, uh, the Chiefs, right? Super Bowl Chiefs. Anyway, he was speaking, and he talked about, and I mean he, he laid it on the line. He's solidly Roman Catholic. But he laid it on the line. He said there just are a lot of Catholics that are not living close to God whatsoever. He talked about our commander-in-chief who, during a pro-abortion rally, makes the sign of the cross. I mean, can you believe that? God bless the ones who are murdering babies. That is, Harrison Bucker says, that is not a devout Roman Catholic at all, Right? I mean, he laid it on the line. And, uh, and, and I, I, tears came to my eyes as he's talking and he, he's exhorting his students are graduating. You women, the greatest job you can have as a mother and as a wife, even though you might have skill, that's the greatest privilege there is. And then he talked about fathers, how they had to take responsibility and be the fathers and the husbands that they need to be. I mean, it was a great message. And so this is it. Here's a man who has courage to do what God wants him to do. And he is telling it straight to those who hate God. He's not saying, bless your heart. He's telling it like he is, right? And that's how David was and that's how we need to be. Not to be those who are struggling with sin. Give them grace like Jesus gave them grace, right? But to those who know wrong and they hate God and they're doing wrong, tell it like it is. Amen?
Amen. Let's look to the Lord in closing prayer. Singers, you can come on up. Heavenly Father, now I thank you for your word. I thank you for King David, who is a man after your own heart, Lord. He did wrong. He knew he did wrong. That's why he wanted you to search his heart. But he also put, you put away his sin when he came and confessed his sin to you. And he hated those who hated you. And Lord, help us not to be buddy buddies with those who hate you. Help us to, be, to, to treat people like Jesus treated people. To treat people like Elisha treated people. To treat people like David treated people. And even when his own men who loved him so much wanted David to kill Saul, David said, no, I won't do it. That's my enemy. He blessed Saul even when his friends wanted him to kill him. He imitated you, Lord. Help us to be imitators of you. We give you thanks now in our Savior's name. Amen.